Republicans, Democrats, they all believe that Trump is a kind of monster who feeds on attention. And the more attention you give the monster, the more powerful the monster becomes. And this is not a crazy theory, okay? There is some truth to it. In fact, it's definitely what happened in the 2015 and 2016 Republican primary. There is no question. The coverage of Trump, obsessive and constant, his name recognition going in really did help elevate him in that race. But it's not 2016 anymore. Right now, Trump is the subject of attention because he's the first ever ex-president to be indicted, because he's currently facing down the possibility of two other indictments. That's not a great reason to get attention. That's negative attention, whether Trump likes it or not. And since 2016, there is pretty good evidence that has accrued, maybe counterintuitively, but robust, that the more attention voters pay to Donald Trump, the less they like him. In fact, even in 2016, Voters didn't really like him very much. He lost a popular vote to Hillary Clinton by about 3 million votes. He narrowly won a fluky electoral college victory with the help of two different criminal conspiracies. One from Russia, which illegally interfered in the election on behalf of Trump. One from Michael Cohen and David Pecker to pay hush money to Storm Daniels, which is now the subject of Trump's indictment. And people forget this, but I was there and I'm telling you, this is how it went down. The thing that really hurt Hillary Clinton in that election was the fact that she was the object of attention, certainly down the stretch. It was the Clinton campaign. Everyone was obsessively focused on her emails, the Comey letter, Huma Abedin's laptop. In the ensuing years, since 2016, since that rupture in the space-time continuum, it has become clear when the general voting public, median, persuadable, normie voters, pay attention to Donald Trump, they don't like him. They don't like what they see. This has been demonstrated over and over again in election after election. It was true in 2018 when the election became a midterm referendum on his presidency and Republicans lost 40 seats in the House. It was true in 2020 when Trump became the first incumbent president to lose re-election since George H.W. Bush in 1992, losing the popular vote by 7 million and underperforming other Republicans up and down the ballot who had up actually a pretty good night. It was certainly true in the most tw recent 2022 midterms when, against all odds, the Democrats had a surprisingly good night. That is in large part because Donald Trump had his fingerprints all over that election, endorsing a bunch of unlikable MAGA weirdos, or as Mitch McConnell euphemistically call it, quote, candidate quality. Our ability to control the primary outcome was quite limited in 22 because of the support of the former president proved to be very decisive in these primaries. So my view was, do the best you can with the cards you're dealt. Now, hopefully in the next uh, cycle, we'll have quality candidates everywhere and a better outcome. I know the point that I'm making here is, is kind of banal, and maybe to some it's obvious, but it's the core truth, and it's this. Everywhere you look, the signs point to the fact that Donald Trump is incredibly unpopular with persuadable voters outside the Republican base. But everyone is so freaked out, so permanently scarred by 2016, that obvious truth is often obscured. And the truth is that Donald Trump, listen to me now, does not possess a magic power that turns political gravity upside down. He is an unlikable figure who lots of persuadable voters find repulsive. Now, he is very, very good. I mean, incredible, really, a generational talent at demanding and receiving lots of attention. But here's the thing. Right now, that is the worst possible thing for the Republican Party because he cannot be ignored. He refuses to be ignored. He will do anything not to be ignored. There is a reason why the smart people in the Republican Party, like Mitch McConnell, who you can't deny has very strong political instincts, doesn't want to talk about Trump, doesn't give quotes on Trump directly. There's a reason they deflect or go off the record when asked about his latest scandal du jour, because they understand this. The more you talk about Donald Trump, the worse it is for the Republican Party. But here's the thing. They're stuck with the guy, aren't they? The guy is still the clear and decisive front runner, Republican primary for 2024, even though he got arraigned in federal court yesterday. Then he went back to Florida to deliver this just unhinged, nasty, threatening, utterly boring, listless, low-energy speech that did nothing to earn him a single new vote from anyone outside his diehard base of supporters. 
the Republican Party has still yoked themselves to him hopelessly to the point where even his challengers for the 2024 nomination are one-upping each other to associate themselves with that spectacle. Mike Pence, who Trump reportedly thought deserved chance of hang Mike Pence from an armed mob, still defends him to this day. Ron DeSantis, who Trump smeared as a groomer, implying he acted inappropriately with young women or girls, still issued a ridiculous statement against Trump's indictment vowing to fight his extradition. At some point, Republicans are going to have to face this reality. The guy's utterly toxic. As long as you keep supporting him, you're going to lose a lot of winnable elections. And again, we keep seeing the proof. Last night, while most of the country was focused on Trump's arraignment, there were two very telling elections. Now, the first was the mayoral race in Chicago, which, yes, is, of course, a dyed-in-the-wool Democratic town. But it's a Democratic town that also had Richie Daley as mayor for 20 years, elected Rahm Emanuel twice. It is more than capable of electing what you might call conservative Democrats. And the conservative Democrat in this race, a guy named Paul Vallis, was running on a tough-on-crime platform. And in certain ways, he had the wind at his back, frankly. I mean, first of all, he had a lot of money, outspent his opponent two to one. And also, violence, gun violence particularly, is a very real problem in Chicago. People are pretty freaked out by it. It's upsetting. The city faces lots of challenges. Yet, Vallis lost the race to progressive challenger Brandon Johnson for a bunch of reasons, not the least of which is because Johnson successfully painted Vallis as a secret Republican tied him to Trump at every turn, pointing to comments like this that Vallis made about Trump's second impeachment after January 6th, when he filled in as a co-host on a right-wing talk show. He should have been censured. He should not have been impeached. And and we knew that this was going to happen, yet they went along with the trial anyway. Right. Also, for those wanting to put Republicans on the spot, if he would have been censured, it would have put much more pressure on them. And, and uh, you know, I always felt that, that it, it was a witch hunt. A witch hunt. What are you doing there, Paul? It's not a good look, buddy. Yes, Fallis is a conservative Democrat. He's not a Republican. The election result once again highlights the conundrum for conservatives broadly and the Republican Party. I mean, look, if you're the conservative in the race, right, you're running in the right lane in a race, running on law and order campaign, right, crackdown on crime against sky high flight inflation. Those should be slam dunk issues for right wingers. This political terrain should be the best terrain for them. They're the political conditions that generally lead to pretty significant electoral victories in the past for conservatives, except their brand has been so thoroughly poisoned by Trump and Trumpism. But here's the thing. Here's why it's even worse for them. It's deeper than just the taint of Trump. They've also got an agenda that is not popular. And they keep doing it over and over. They're pushed to ban abortions, for instance. Along with Trump, abortion was the top issue that drove Democrats to overperform in the 2022 midterms. It is still absolutely driving voters to the polls today. You see, the other big election last night was in Wisconsin, where a crucial race for a state Supreme Court was effectively a referendum on abortion. Abortion is currently illegal in Wisconsin. Conservatives controlled that Supreme Court. If liberals flipped control with this one seat, they could lift the state's abortion ban. Those were the stakes, and voters showed up. There was a massive turnout, and the liberal candidate, a woman named Janet Protasewicz, won decisively. Get this, it is looking like she won by about 10 points. That is a pretty dramatic victory for what is effectively a 50-50 state. And even in the ancestral Republican enclave of the Milwaukee suburbs, the party of Trump keeps losing ground. Take Ozaki County, for example, one of the three conservative counties crucial Republicans to be competitive in Wisconsin. Last night, Republicans barely eked out a victory in that county, about five points. Get this, in 2012, Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney won Ozaki by 30 points. In 2014, incumbent Republican Governor Scott Walker won it by 40. It now seems completely plausible it could flip blue in a matter of years. None other than Ann Coulter, who of course is recklessly offensive and cruel, uh, hit the nail on the head. (laughs) Seriously, listen to this. When she tweeted, quote, the demand for anti-abortion legislation just cost Republicans another crucial race. Pro-lifers, we won. Abortion's not a constitutional right anymore. Please stop pushing strict limits on abortion or there will be no Republicans left. (laughs) She's right. That's the problem. The base believes it. They didn't want to just get rid of Roe v. Wade. They want to outlaw abortion everywhere. They demand nothing less than full abortion criminalization everywhere. 
Look at Florida. Again, all eyes on Trump at the arraignment, right? We got Wisconsin. We got Chicago. Meanwhile, look at Florida. Ron DeSantis is about to do one of the most politically disastrous things he could possibly do. He is going to sign a law that effectively bans abortion in Florida. He has no choice. The primary voters in the Republican Party demand it. It's going to be a massive anvil around his neck if and when he runs for president, if he gets the nomination. But he's going to do it because that's what the MAGA base wants, even though what they want is increasingly out of touch with the median voter. That is once again the fundamental conundrum. Republicans have locked themselves in this MAGA universe that voters, general election voters, persuadable voters keep recoiling from. Not just on abortion. I mean, the House Republican Caucus took over <laughs> the House, and they're holding multiple hearings about Twitter for the love of God. Republican state legislators, state after state governors, are waging an all-out assault on trans teenagers, including a Kansas bill Republicans there passed today that critics say could expose children to genital inspections. This stuff, listen to me, is not winning politics. They keep doing it. They keep going further, and they keep having a harder time persuading anyone who doesn't already agree with them. Which leads them to their final recourse, which is to just withdraw from or subvert the democratic processes altogether. Trump seeming pretty much unrattled. And in fact, if you haven't checked in with him and his public appearances over the last two years, you may have noticed he seemed a lot looser, uh, really, than he did when last we saw him in January of 2021, in case you haven't been following it. <laughs> there is Tucker Carlson in full scramble mode last night, coming out of Donald Trump's lethargic, vindictive speech, desperately pretending Trump was looser than the last time we saw him in January 2021. Now, of course, we know from internal emails that Tucker is terrified his audience will abandon him for Newsmax if he says anything less than fawning about the criminal defendant ex-president. This is why the Fox News channel is in so much trouble right now. It's why a Delaware judge not only allowed Dominion's $1.6 billion lawsuit to go to trial later this month, but explicitly ruled that statements Fox hosts and guests said about Dominion were false. Quoting from the judge's opinion, the evidence developed in the civil proceeding demonstrates that it is crystal clear that none of the statements relating to Dominion about the 2020 election are true. The judge even emphasized that word, crystal, in his ruling. Today, that same judge said he would compel Fox Corp executives Rupert Murdoch and Lachlan Murdoch to testify live. Plus, Fox's attorneys agreed to let host Tucker, Maria Bartiromo, Lou Dobbs, Janine Pirro, and Sean Hannity testify live as well. There's a lot they have to answer for, but one of the things I am most fascinated by is their commitment over at Fox to booking one specific guest. Mike Lindell, the pillow guy, is a major advertiser on Fox News, especially Tucker's show, which has hemorrhaged more respectable advertisers due to the host's habit of promoting white nationalist talking points. We counted one night alone last week, Lindell ran three ads during Tucker's one-hour program. It was always kind of clear Lindell was maybe keeping Tucker's show afloat, but now we have proof you see, in addition to being the pillow guy, Lindell is also a MAGA conspiracy enthusiast who regularly promotes the most outlandish and possibly defamatory version of Trump's big lie of a stolen election. Now, that creates kind of a problematic incentive structure for a show that needs his advertising bucks. Thanks to Dominion, their lawsuit, which is currently suing Fox for defamation, in part due to claims that Lindell himself made, we know exactly how Tucker's producers handled that thorny question behind the scenes. On the afternoon of January 26, 2021, well after the insurrection, after Biden's inauguration, Tucker's show decided to have Lindell on. They were hoping to frame the segment around his recent Twitter ban. A booking producer messaged the team, quote, Good morning, all. Mike Lindell was pitched last night for stores having pulled his product, and Tucker approved it. I see the news this morning that his Twitter has been suspended. I just wanted to flag all this because is he someone we want to have on? About 30 seconds later, she sent a parenthetical follow-up, quote, Lindell seems to have really gone off the deep end. About a minute later, another producer responded, quote, he's definitely crazy, but this will be a big story today. They're trying to completely shut the guy down. Yeah, why would they be trying to shut the guy down? The next hour, an unknown producer then responds, quote, I'm going to have a conversation with Raj in the next few minutes. Presumably that's Raj Shah, senior vice president of Fox. I'll take the temperature there, but for the time being, we should put the brakes on it. 
That, dear viewer, is the end of the story. They put the brakes on booking the pillow man and no, no, of course, they put him on TV anyway. Because later that afternoon, Tucker Senior Producer responded, quote, copy, I know there's concern about Lindell being a conspiracy theorist now, but he has bailed us out loads of times when no one else would. I think there's a way we can concentrate on cancel culture rather than his wild claims. Before adding, quote, and he's also been moving to Newsmax lately. Might be a good business move to signal we won't deserve it, desert him. That booker, who initiated the conversation, then chimed back in to add, quote, yeah, I do see the point that more exposure of him also means more people dropping him potentially. And if no one is buying him, he loses money to be able to advertise with us, and then we lose our biggest advertiser. <laughs> the booking producer desperately trying to save Mike Lindell's pillow business from Mike Lindell. About an hour later, one more producer chimes in with some frankly reasonable concerns. Quote, Mike Lindell is crazy and about to get sued by Dominion. WTF is he going to say on our air? You know what, producer? Great question. What is Lindell going to say? Well, you see, we've got the answer to that question because Tucker did book Lindell, did claim the interview would be focused on cancel culture, but Mike Pillow had other ideas. Of course, you will likely recognize our next guest. His name is Mike Lindell. He runs My Pillow. He advertises every night on this show and across Fox News. He's one of our biggest sponsors, and we are grateful for that. He is sponsoring free speech when he does it. But of course, the enforcers of orthodoxy are not impressed. They're enraged. For the crime of having different opinions, Mike Lindell has just been banned from Twitter. Several retailers have also stopped selling his products. That happened today. All these outlets that have been calling me from the Washington Post, New York Times, every, every outlet in the country, they go, Mike Lindell, there's no evidence and he's making fraudulent statements. No, I have the evidence. I dare people to put it on. I dare Dominion to sue me because then it would get out faster. I dare Dominion to sue me or maybe sue you because it will get out faster. Honestly, this is just scratching the surface of everything we learned about the inner workings of Fox this week, but thanks to that Delaware judge, we will soon be learning a lot more.